Women hold the one power, but men still control much of this world. And they are rarely kind to little girls who show a spark of being greater than they are. I... I... No. No! I'm not even getting paid to do this yet! All right. Howdy, y'all. I am Adam the Renaissance Nerd. And welcome to this continuing train wreck that is Amazon's Wheel of Time, not to be confused or even recognized as Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. Before we get started, a couple quick things to go over. It has been pointed out to me on a couple of occasions in the comments and rightfully so to an extent that my pronunciation of names is not always, shall we say, spot on. Let's be, let's be honest, folks. I've been reading these books since the 90s for a long time. I didn't read the glossaries in the back for fear of spoilers when I first read it. And then what did I need to read them for? So I didn't always go and check the pronunciations of the names. So I'm kind of set in my ways and in, in a lot of instances and in saying names and places in certain ways. If you have been reading these books as long as I have as well, you, you will understand that. It's kind of hard to break a habit. Just be happy I say Egwene correctly. Forever, until, you know, recently I said Egwene all the damn time. So cut me some slack. It's just habit. Normal people, I think you can understand. As for the stands that come along, don't care what you think. If you think that I give a damn how you feel about me and everybody else who has come around to this video in the previous videos, because they're seeking the truth of how bad this show is, I don't, I don't care what you think. I'll never care what you think, because you're cowards behind keyboards. All right, now, on with the show. Oh, boy. <sighs> Let it be clearly stated. We are in uncharted territory, my friends. This show has... We're not even off the rails. We're into the wilderness with how far this train wreck is continuing to go. This episode is a, bas is a complete bastardized fan fiction version of... Eye of the world. You will see moments that are that were plucked and placed very poorly and sloppily to create the feel of events from Eye of the World. But these are not events from Eye of the World. These are not events from Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. Then this is just one giant cluster F of crap. This is crap. It really is. So how am I going to go about doing this? Because before, when it was sort of still on the tracks and just coming off the rails, I could compare and contrast, and I can still sort of do that. But now that we're really off the rails, I'm going to have to approach my analysis. I'm going to have to approach all this a little differently. So we're going to be focusing on characters a lot more because the characters are all completely out of character or don't even remotely look like they're supposed to. Oh <laughs> boy. Loyal. <laughs> I was warned. I hadn't looked at it until now. And uh, oh my God. Oh my God. An Ogier does not look what. All right, we'll get to that. We're going to get to Loyal. All right, I'm going to continue the pattern from last review where I'm going to block off all the events around specific characters because as usual, the direction, the storyboarding of this, it's all over the place, jumping back and forth like a bad episodic TV show on major network television. It just jumps back and forth, and it, you, you get you're lost half the time. So we're going to try and block everything together, and we will uh, attempt to dissect and analyze this abomination. So without further ado, on with the show.
Mountain? What? A month without a warm bed will do that. That mountain? What? I don't know. I think I've seen it before. Okay, so we begin the episode with a burial ceremony for everybody that died during the attack on the Ace Sedai camp by Logan's 50 guys. <laughs> and everybody looks like they're mourning. They, they, they're burying the, the, the Ace Sedai who I never heard of before this show who died and her water's broken. And we're going to talk about the water and the Ace Sedai bond when we get to his section of the review. That's at the end because. It leads into the end of the show. But it's basically, let's be sad moment. And that's kind of what this whole episode's going to be a lot about. Let's be sad and surprise, let's talk about our feelings a lot. That's kind of the SJW handbook when it comes to writing. Let's sit around and talk about feelings. All right, so as the clip just showed you, though, we're going to start with Rand and Matt. Now. In the eye of the world, we don't see Tar Valen. We never see it. We hear about it. A lot of references to it. But we don't see it. Tar Valen does not come into play until the Great Hunt. So, to suddenly have everybody arriving at Tar Valen from different directions, instead of Camelin, as they do in Eye of the World, where eventually our band of merry heroes reunite um it's uh it's very jarring very jarring to now suddenly be here in tar valen tar valen a place that randall thor to my knowledge and my memory never sets foot in once after the events of eye in the world rand goes off on his own adventure in the great hunt and then he's off camera in the Dragon Reborn, and when we start Shadow Rising, he's off to build his army. And he's going all over the world at that point, but never in Tar Valon because of the events of the actual lore that would keep him away from it, and his distrust of A Sedai, which is constant because he doesn't want to be manipulated. But this is not the Rand from the books. This is the Rand who we know nothing about. And as that clip shows, he says, that, that mountain, I have a feeling, that mountain whose name has not been mentioned once, I believe, in this series yet, that is Dragon Mount, born when Louis Theron gave one last burst of power as he killed himself after realizing he had killed his family. Dragon Mount, born from his grief, as he aided in the mill moment that is known as the breaking of the world. So yes, that's the significance of Dragon Mount. But we don't know that because this show hasn't bothered to tell us about it. Well, we know that, oh, oh, I feel like I, I, I feel like I know that mountain. Oh. So there you go. That's about it. And then you'll get another shot of it behind Tar Valen. And, and I'm going to say Tar Valen looks like a nice layout of the city. I felt that I think it could be a little bigger. Could be a little bigger, but it looks nice. I'll give them that. Well done. That's about the only compliment you're going to get from me for the rest of this episode. Anyway, so <sighs> Matt and Rand now tra traipse through the city in the way they would have traipsed through Camelin in the actual Eye of the World book. They seek lodgings based on Tom's telling them to go here, go there. And they start to settle in, and then, oh boy, <laughs> oh my god, this, what is this? This is Loial. All right, let race swap aside. Let race swap aside. We knew that was going to happen when I did my video way back yonder earlier this year. Race swap aside. What? What? E what is all that? With the hair, the the hair, the nose. I mean, the the sausage fingers are about the only accurate thing on the ogier. There, that's about the only other thing. I mean, what's with the nose? Um, what's what's with the his ears are supposed to be 
pointy and, and tuft and be able to droop and this and that. I mean, it, it's and the hair. The, I mean, here is the cover, the original cover of The Great Hunt. That's Loyal right there. That's Loyal as portrayed on the original cover art of The Great Hunt. What the living hell? Not to mention the way he behaves completely out of character. He's behaving as if he's this wizened, knowledgeable, world-traveled person. Loyal, even though he's very old by human standards and young by Ogier standards, he, uh, he is not that confident. In fact, he's very, he lacks a lot of confidence in anything. And we learn why as we get into his backstory. <laughs> it's woo! this, and so his interaction with Rand here is some bastardized version of how they meet in Camelin in the real books. And it's just kind of, I don't know how to really describe it. Loyal's talking and like that. I mean, yes, they sort of try to get the vibe how Loyal will ramble on when talking, but it's just. It's awkward and it's strange. And it's not Loyal at all. So once again, another character introduced completely OOC out of character. And Rand, again, Rand, this is paper thin Rand. Has no idea what's going on. We have no idea who he really is. It's just paper thin. So they have a really awkward conversation about books and this and that. And of course, Rand has to wax poetic about how he great is so great, how she had such adventures in her mind when she grew up reading this book. I mean, you're gonna see that a lot in this sh in this episode. A lot of waxing poetic about he how great Egwene is, how powerful and strong is. Never once do we see men at all, any of the male characters portrayed as strong in this. They're all weepy, they're all cucked, they're all depressed. There's no hope. All the hope comes from the women in this. So they have the conversation, and then, boom, they hear the sounds. Those who have sent out to capture Loghain have returned. <laughs> so return the triumphant Aesedai with Loghain to parade him through the city. Let's just forget that in the books, this happens in Camelin, where a lot of other important events happen, which steer us towards the actual end of the Eye of the World. But no, 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 that's Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. This is Amazon's Wheel of Time, where everybody's arrived in Tar Valen to do their stuff. Anyway, so they're parading him through town, and as Loghain is going by Rand and Matt sitting in a window, though Matt has this psychedelic moment with Loghain and you saw the laughter there and then Rand and Matt have this nice little conversation of if one of us channels we have to promise to kill each other because I don't want to go mad <laughs> because in this world madness sets in almost immediately as soon as a male can channel it's not gradual it's not bit by bit it's instant there you go instantaneous anywho after that uh, Matt is then back and sicky in bed. And now we're going to skip forward a bit of the episode and we will come back to the fact that Nynaeve is out and about because Nynaeve, Nynaeve appears here. We'll talk about Nynaeve in two, two segments from now. Nynaeve arrives escorted by Loyal. And that Loyal's purpose to be a, a scene taxi, as it were, to bring people together. Again, <laughs> woo. And, and and all his weirdness and oddness. And then, thanks, Loyal, go away now. You're out of character anyway. So we have Nynaeve gets reunited with Rand. And this is later in the episode, as I said. And immediately, Nynaeve takes control. She's in command. She's in control. She's the one bolstering sad Rand, who's worried about Matt, and who's pining for Egwene again. Once again, Egwene, I go sad and Egwene is in here. And then Nynaeve tells this supposed to be heartwarming story about how when Egwene was sick as a child with a fever, 
She refused to give in to it. She refused to give up and she fought her way back to being healthy through the night of pain in a disease that would that killed just about everybody else when it happened. And it's just great. Gwen is so great and strong. We almost bow to Gwen and Rand's like, yeah, it sounds like Gwen all right. <laughs> Shucks, I miss her touching my dangle. <laughs> Anywho, um, and then again, it basically, Nine was like, we're going to be okay. And she's, let, let's forget the fact that throughout this entire scene, interacting with Matt in the bed, talking with Rand, she's completely out of character. Remember, Nine Eve has one setting in the early part of this entire grand story. Bitch on wheels. Bitch on wheels. Deep down, caring bitch on wheels, but bitch on wheels. And in this scene, she's got, a warm bedside manner as opposed to her standard abrasive bedside manner of you better do what I say. Or I'm going to box your ears, match and cough them. No, Matt, it's okay. It's okay, Matt. I'm here for you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> all smiling, all weepy, all, oh, let's be all nice and talking. No, that, that's not naive. And that, and as I said before, that's not really Rand. This is Rand who has no development, nothing whatsoever. Well, that, that's kind of it for Rand and Matt for the episode. That's it. That's all you get. All you get from two top Varen. That's it. Nine Eve gets way more development in this episode, but that's one segment away because next we're going to talk about Heron and the glorious Egwene. Drift. Just drift. Ah. There you are. And so begins the perilous adventures of Perrin, wolf brother, or sort of wolf brother, and the glorious Egwene, the powerful and strong Egwene. All right, so we pick up in the month time skip. They've been running with the Tinkers, the Tuatha on, and unlike Rand, who has been clearly pining for Egwene, Egwene seems at this point perfectly happy, not thinking about Rand at all. La 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 la, I'm so happy. Pounces on parent back. Hey guys, what are you talking about? Oh, we're talking about you, says Aram. Isn't that great? Oh. And now everything's happy, hunky dory with the freaking Tuatha on hippies. But, and right up until this point, I'm starting to think that Perrin, they're not going to do Perrin and the White Cloaks. There'll be no Perrin and his, the whole core of his. Basically, massive first arc in the entire story of the real time. Him versus the Children of the Light. And uh, <laughs> they proved me wrong. Here comes the Children of the Light blocking the road to Tar Valen. And uh, Eamon Valda, who is completely not the Eamon Valda books. I haven't talked about it because he was only in that one episode early on. He is not an Inquisitor. He's a Lord Captain Commander, I think, Lord Captain, he's, he's not an Inquisitor. In this one, he's an Inquisitor. He's black, and he's sadistic and evil, even though the Inquisitors are sadistic and evil, but the whole chopping off of the hands, collecting rins thing, that, 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 that's not a thing in the book with him. This is not his character at all. This is completely, this, this is a combination of several different characters with the name Iman Valda, Child Valda, slapped on it, just for the record. Anyway, so Valda and his children of the light have stopped the Tinkers and they want to question people. And then they see, for some reason, Egwene and Perrin. He sees them. It's like, oh, for no reason, I want to talk to them. Just boom. There you go. I want to talk to them. Of course, the Tinkers say no. And then they comically lock arms. They, they lock arms to block their passage. While Aram tries to get Egwene and Perrin out of there. Of course, the children just start beating on him. <laughs> it's funny. I'm sorry. It's funny because it's stupid. And Egwene and Perrin think they're getting away. But then here come the children and they round them up and take them away. So now we skip forward. They have been taken prisoner by the children of the light. And Egwene, they showed this really weird scrubbing procedure. It's very awkward and strange. Definitely not in the books of Egwene being scrubbed down and 
cleaned and hairbrushed and put in a white shift shift and and then tied to a chair and there comes Perrin bound and gag and Valdo begins to question them and he says oh Egwene you are a you're you're a, you're a you can channel and I, I'm gonna prove you can channel by torturing Perrin basically I'm gonna make you admit you can channel and he does this weird thing where he pours wine on the back of his knife and then rips off the back of Perrin's shirt and starts to cut into him. And while he's doing that, oh, look, Perrin's eyes glow gold. Oh, look, fan service. Remember Perrin? He has golden eyes in the book because he's a wolf brother and he can talk with wolves even though we've only seen the wolves lick his leg and there's no Elias to explain anything about being a wolf brother to us at all. Not even, not there, not. So nothing about the wolves has been explained, but Perrin's eyes are glowing gold through the pain. Suddenly, through the pain, his eyes are glowing like he's, maybe he's going to go Super Saiyan or something. I don't know. And he, so then Valda gives them a, 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 a um, gives them an offer. One of you can survive if you basically turn on the other. It's basically what it is. You admit you're a witch. You can channel. He goes free. He admits that he admits to nothing. Then he, you go free and whatever. Anyway, then they're left and they're crying and uh, Egwene's all tearful. Oh, Perrin, we'll get out of this. Don't worry. And he's like, no. And, and this dude's same acting, pathetic, mopey presentation of Perrin. Oh, Egwene, you need to let me die. I killed my wife. No, you didn't. That trial like said, no, I mean, we were fighting and, and I swung my axe with all my might and I killed her so I need to die. That's, that is Rafe Judkin's version of Perrin's uh, feeling upset about wielding an axe. And he did it, he wielded an axe once. And since then he hasn't fought anything. He hasn't done anything. He's done nothing but run and be protected by women. So... Perrin, he's, he's weeping and crying, and Egwene's like, Egwene's like <laughs> they cry, and then, then it fades away. Then we come back to them later, and Valda comes back in, and he's like, oh, good, you're ready to talk, la, la, la. And he says, oh, maybe you're not. I'm going to torture Perrin some more. And this is more of the whole gratuitous violence and gore that this show is now pretty much famous for that didn't really exist in Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. So he continues to cut into him. He's like, man, I've got golden eyes. I'm going Super Saiyan. I'm resisting. And Egwene says, all right, fine. I'm going to channel. Now, here is the beginning of Mary Sue Egwene. Remember, in the books, Egwene, at this point, prior to the separation of Shatter Logoth, and then afterwards, when reunited with Moraine, Moraine has been training Egwene in the One Power, talking about the blooming flower motif, how you embraced Seder. And you let it flow through you, controlling about weaves and this and that, she, and about the practicing of making the flame. Practice making and maintaining the flame. Egwene in the books had been training for months at this point. Weeks, maybe months, I don't know. Time's very, it's a very big book. <laughs> Sometimes you lose track how long they've been on the road. She's been training in the books. This She hasn't had an, a moment of training that we know of. One moment of Moraine testing her to see if she can channel. That was it. So suddenly now, Egwene knows how to embrace Seder. I say Seder. They say the one power, but they remember. She knows how to summon the power. She knows how to channel all of the sudden, and she can make the flame and it's a poof, but it's a distraction because Egwene is a Mary Sue and she's a better tactical genius than this fake Eamon Valda. And she, meanwhile, burns away Perrin's ropes and her own ropes at the time while Valda's distracted. And then Perrin breaks frame. For a moment, you think, for just a moment, you think that Perrin might get his story back on track by cutting down. Valda, even though he doesn't cut down, he cuts down, I forget his name right now, a different child, um, child of the light, which causes the whole problem of him killing children. And the white cloaks are then after him. But no, he just stalks towards him, lumbering, <laughs> with his eyes golden. Like, oh, in the light, what are you? <laughs> the dark one. <laughs> that is the stupid shit. And 
Then, Egwene stabs him from behind. Once again, stealing the thunder and stealing the story from Perrin the man. So the man doesn't get to do the action. Egwene saves the day. Or mostly, because now, because he was in pain, Perrin's wolf brother stuff activated, and it summoned the wolves to attack the camp. Now, in the story, actual story of Eye of the World, yes, the wolves come, but they come because Elias brings them. And at the same time, in the books, Lon, Moraine, and Nynaeve arrive to also help aid them in their escape in a subtle, sneaky sort of way. And then the wolves attack, and then you have the actual wolves attacking, and then all kinds of, all kinds of cool shit happens in the book because they're on the run again from the White Cloaks, too. Good stuff. Anywho. So, the wolves are attacking the camp, slaughtering in a very bloody, gory fashion all the white cloaks. And one stops them, but Perrin's like, no, we can, it's okay, we can trust the wolf. Actually, let me say, he's like, it's okay, we can trust him. How do you know? Uh, I don't know, I just do. So, then they clearly take horses and they're gone. That's pretty, that's pretty much it for Egwene and Perrin. And we'll talk more about that later, because now... Now we get to talk about Nynaeve. Nynaeve, who has so much power that she needs to be careful. Can you ever go back to being who you were? I know, because I felt it too the first time. And the answer is no. Nynaeve Almera. At least we're supposed to think this is Nynaeve Almera. This Nynaeve doesn't behave like Nynaeve at all. You see glimpses of, uh, full, of, you know, bitch on wheels, but it's an on the wrong moments and it's portrayed poorly. Basically, what happens with Nynaeve here? We already talked about earlier where she gets reconnected with Rand and is, you know, I'm in charge, I'm gonna help everything and I'm gonna give the empowering hopeful speech. But up until before that point, because that's the end of the Nynaeve arc in this episode, before that, you saw there, she is, they've arrived in Tar Valen. They're trying to hide her in the water, the water section of the tower. And Moraine is giving her this really lame speech of, you need to embrace what you're going to become with all your power. And you need to be aware that people are going to try and manipulate and use who don't trust anybody in the tower. I mean, this at the same time is also Moraine being completely out of character, talking to Nynaeve in a nice sisterly, auntly, maybe even close to motherly fashion. And it's just ridiculously stupid. And it falls flat because you got this, this puss there, you know, like, like showing, like trying to show quivering emotion. And, and, and Nynaeve doesn't show fear outwardly because of her bitch on wheels mentality. Anyway, gives this whole speech. And then uh, in the end saying, she, Nynaeve's like, will you tell me when my friends get here? I mean, that's the moment you see actual sort of Nynaeve personality. But then Maureen's like, of course I'll tell you. All right. Nynaeve's story then progresses later on where our um our sad warden, who we're going to talk about in the final segment here, next, coming up next, our sad warden comes to her for some, for basically some some sleeping powder. You know, he needs He needs to make some... He needs to make a tea that'll help him sleep because he can't sleep because the water bond broken with his dead a said eye is making him depressed. And Nynaeve's all helpful. And again, this is out of character Nynaeve being all nice, being pleasant. And it's just stupid. And then he leaves the door open after he, after she, after he leaves and she wanders out. And this is now where we get a very, another, uh, of course, this whole thing never happens in the books. Nine even the books arrives at the White Tower during the great during the great hunt with Egwene and Elaine Trackend to become novices. She, she's already going to do it. It's not I'm protecting you because they'll force you to be a novice. No, she's already agreed to do this because she wants to learn to be the 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 bestest healer ever. This Nynaeve has no. This Nynaeve just still wants to run away with her with her her friends. But anyway. So she's standing in the water quarters and she's looking at these old water statues. And then here comes Leandrin. Leandrin, who is basically, and I'm going to elaborate more on this in the next segment, who is kind of taking over 
the role that Eleda has in the book. Who is Eleda? Eleda is the most powerful, prominent red sister. And in this in the actual book at this point is the uh, advisor to Queen Morgaze of Camelon. This one, we haven't even heard of Leda. We've not even heard the term Morgays. And Leandrin has just been put forward as the most powerful red sister. And she's also trying to, she's trying to earworm her way into Nine to convince her that she should be a red sister. Even though Nine was always wanted to be a yellow sister in the books once she accepted her fate as being a Sedai. <sighs> anyway, they have this really dumb conversation where Nynaeve's trying to be all, oh, I can see you trying to manipulate me. And Elena's like with her big square jaw. God, that thing could chisel stone. Anyway, we're trying to just weave around. Then it's like, oh, enjoy your time. And then she walks away. And then that's kind of it. Then Loyal will find Nynaeve because Loyal apparently has free reign of Tarvalon. And then we get the Rand scene that I talked about earlier. So that's, that's kind of it for Nynaeve, although in this whole thing, you get this giant development of she's friendly with everybody. She's really nice. She's unsure about her power, but she's determined to get away and be the strong, hopeful leader. I mean, it's it's all. Even though it's so small when you compact it like I just did, it's still more character development than Rand has had in five episodes. We know more about Nynaeve and her motivations than we know about Rand. All Rand cares about is having Egwene touch his dingle dangle. That's it. So that's kind of it for Nynaeve. She gets referenced in the last segment when we're talking about Lon, but now we're going to talk about the Ace Sedai and the Warders. Ay, 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 ay. We are going into complete fiction here. Well, complete. Fi we're already in fiction. This is fan fiction. Bad fan fiction at that. I don't know. I've. Uh... Never been with a man. Two men. <laughs> Certainly not two men. Okay, we're going to round out the synopsis. Talking about the Ace Set Eye and Water sections of this episode, which are clear examples that those involved with this show do not under fully understand Ace Set Eye or Warders do not understand these particular characters portrayed and are clearly bastardizing the lore once again. Anyway, so to cut to the chase, uh, we're going to have Moraine's section and then Sad Warden and Lawn's section of this. So the Moraine section is basically, uh, she has now been away from the tower for two years. So let's remember that in the actual story, Maureen never returns to Tar Valen. No, she is following Rand around until events separate her from Rand for a very long time. And uh, that, that's, that's what happens. She never goes back to Tar Valen. And all events where she interacts with certain important is said, I'd like the Emerald and Seed, happen in other places around the world. And she never comes, she doesn't have a relationship with Leandrin. She doesn't have a relationship with these, these other Ace Sedai, the way they're all talking. It's different in the book. Very different. But no, here we are in Amazon's Wheel of Time, where they've all come back to Tar Valen, and now she's being pressured to get back into Tar Valen politics, because apparently the Amerlin, Siwan Sanch, is out of control. She's angry. And now, if anybody who knows the actual relationship between Maureen and Siwan, they have a special relationship. I'm not going to spoil it because I want to see where they go in this. I want to see if they actually go the right direction and even touch on what their relationship is really like with, of course, race swapped Siwan in this. Anywho, she's trying to be convinced. She has a little tongue in cheek moment with Aleda. Oh, oh, you've been away for a long time. You need to be careful. Nynaeve. She's going to be a red sister. And Morin's like, oh, no, she's not. She's going to be a yellow sister. She's going to make her pass. She's, gonna, she's strong when she becomes a novice. I mean, it's, it's, it's catty behavior that is beneath a said I conversations. Then you have her talking with Alana about how she has to get back in the pocket. She has to challenge 
for the Amarlins. It's just one of the only ones that can do it because many people are siding with Leandrin. And as I mentioned in the last segment of the video, Leandrin seems to be being maneuvered to replace Aleda as the central red sister. And if you know anything about the books, the central red sister who will challenge for the Amarlin seat, you know that this is all kinds of wrong, considering where Leandrin's true loyalties lie. So Maureen's like, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I need, I have my, I have my purpose. And, and then the stupid two shot, you can't keep your secrets. And it's all just, it's ham-fisted. It's, they're trying to display the, the, the mysterious and cards close to the chest, Maureen, and they just do a horrible job of it. They, do, they just do a very bad job of it. And of course, all of this is being played alongside Sad Warden's story and Lon being completely out of character. Completely out of character. I'll explain why as we go forward. So Sad Warden, if you don't know anything about the Warden bond to an A's Sedai, they, they touch on it ever so slightly in all of this. They touch on it slightly that when an a, if an Ace Sedai dies before her Warden and the bond is broken, it's with such a deep spiritual connection that the Wardens become depressed and borderline suicidal. Now, if my memory serves, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. When a Warden loses his Ace Sedai, they choose not to simply kill themselves. They choose to go out in a blaze of glory. They head off towards the Blight. Adam, what's the Blight? The Blight hasn't been mentioned at all in this. Oh, I don't know. The Blight's bringing me the one of the most important aspects of the geography of this world. The encroaching Blight. The touch of the Dark One. The land in which Shao Ghul resides. The, the prison of the Dark One, the Blight, is, is just eating everything, eating all life, pushing farther and farther south. Warders, again, I, this is what my memory tells me. Warders, when that happens, when they lose their Sedai, they march off to the Blight to kill as many Trollocs and Mirdral as they can before they die. They want, they just, that, that's the last thing they can do unless they take another A Sedai, which is generally not the practice even though it's offered, especially by the Greens, who can have multiple warders. But Sad Warder here, now they go through this whole manufactured importance of the ring. The Great Serpent Ring is simply a symbol, one of the symbols of Nae Sedai. In this stupid show, it's replaced the shawl, where when they're not incognito, a Sedai wear shawls with their color represented on it. They don't all walk around in the color of their, of their Aja. They don't all do that. That's not how it works. But in this it is. No, but in this stupid show, the ring has the color of the Aja on it. And then you have to take the ring back and they create this whole thing where he goes and returns it to maybe where they melt the melt the metal for the rings. It, it's it's really stupid and it's drawn out and it's pathetic because all it is is to show how weak men are as compared to the strong women. Even though at one point we do see Maureen cry and be and be heartfelt. But then again, that's breaking Maureen's character. She is She's stone-faced. She doesn't reveal what she's thinking. She doesn't show too much outward emotion. She's able to keep it in check because she's thinking about the long game. But you get Sad Warden's story about how he's depressed and how everybody's doing their best to keep him happy and they're going to offer him another. Alana's going to offer him a, a bond so that he can be joined in. So that clip, oh, if you join with her, you're going to have to be bisexual gay with them. Because apparently that's how sexuality works. Oh, I'm just going to try out doing it with dudes because I've never done that before, but it's okay. It's all right. I'm okay. I mean, cringe, cringe. Anybody out there watching this who part of the alphabet community, that's not how it works, is it? Either are you aren't. You don't just decide, oh, I'm going to try it out. Maybe I'll like this flavor of wang. <laughs> It's um, it's ridiculous. So you saw that one scene I talked about. He goes to Nynaeve to try and get some sleeping medicine because he, he apparently can't sleep. When, in fact, he uses it to drug Lon. He uses drug Lon in the tea. But before he does that, they have a whole conversation about the Forsaken. 
We've barely heard mention of the Forsaken. At this point, you don't even know who the Forsaken are. They've mentioned one name, Ishmael. That, that's the only Forsaken. I mean, again, they, they are doing a horrible job of the lore. And when they do, it's in such brief passing without real connection or connective tissue to the world at large. You have no idea what it means. How do we know in this story that the Forsaken are 12 of the most powerful Ace Sedai from the Age of Legends that chose to join the Dark One? They say it in for like a half a second here, and then they move along. And they don't even mention it, they just say Ishmael. That's all they say, Ishmael. So it's completely glossed over, more lore glossed over. And then throughout this whole thing, throughout this whole procedure, Lon, throughout this whole segment of, this, of the episode, he's talking, he's emotional, he's being a friend, he's being good. He's, he's referencing how, oh, I think, I'm, I think Nine Eve is in love with me. And, but that's such a bad thing. Where we had zero buildup for that, as opposed to the books, where there was a lot of buildup for it. But here it's just suddenly, oh, Nine has been eating, eating meals at the warden fire. So she's just, she's in love with him now. But it's a bad thing. Why is it a bad thing? This point in Eye of the World, we've had a lot of background of Lon. We know what his background is, what his backstory is. We know why it's a bad idea. We know why he is so rigid, why he is emotionless, why he doesn't show caring for anybody, barely anything for Moraine. So you see Lon is completely out of character, especially here. Look at this. Yes, that is from the final moments of the episode where after being drugged, Sad Warden has disappeared in the dawn, early dawn of the day and gone and killed himself because he gave in to the... He, he killed himself. Let's forget, like I said, that I'm pretty sure that Wardens, when their bond is broken, they go off to the Blight and go out in a blaze of glory as, a, as just in, in a very manly Alpha Chad way. This is I'm taking the coward's way out and stabbing myself to bleed out. And then you see this total fabrication of a warden funeral. I mean, it's and, and the schmaltz of it all, the lameness of it all. Maureen crying. Maureen wouldn't shed tears if you were cutting her thumb off. She would keep it together. So out of character. Everybody's out of character completely. And then Lon crying to the heavens episode over. Let's get to the analysis of this all and really what what have we just watched that is very odd i like all the things where do we start well this episode in my opinion in my humble opinion it signifies at this point exactly what they plan to do with the rest of this season and season two and did they have is there a season three I guess I'll a season three. My God, how and why? But they have run so far off the rails into the wilderness that this is not Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time in both spirit or faith. The characters are all wrong. The events are now fabricated, copied from actual events and pasted in a sloppy manner. And the agenda is all over this. Why do I say the agenda? I've been mentioning this the whole video. The men, they're not acting like men. They're sitting around. They're talking about their feelings. They're being bolstered by strong, powerful women. They're weepy. They're depressed. They're emotional. And they, uh, they have no drive. And they're being saved constantly by women yes this is there's not a i've said it before wheel of time books there are large large sections of each book where no action happens it's a lot of character driven story driven events you have to rely on the good fun well-developed characters to keep you interested and keep you going this story i mean sorry this episode 
should have been carried by good characters, but it isn't because of agenda and f intersectional feminism. Egwene is constantly bolstered in this episode, how great she is at that, and she saves Perrin, as opposed to the books where Perrin saves her, finds her first. No one was being tortured yet. <sighs> then, <coughs> excuse me, then you've got the warders behaving like, like catty women. Like catty women. Oh, we're dressing you for your funeral. We're talking. Isn't it great? Oh, we're going to be here for you. While the women are out talking politics and power moves in the halls. The Ace said I with like Moraine and Leandrin. Oh, Rand and Matt, they don't know what they're doing. Rand needs Nynaeve to bolster, bolster his, give him direction and he, while, while he's pining for Egwene. You, you see what I'm saying here? There's no, everything's been reversed because that's what the SJW woke virtue signaling intersectional feminist agenda does. It flips the book around. Men need saving, men need protecting, women are empowered to do whatever they want, and that's what they're doing. You saw the clip at the very beginning of the video. Leandra going, oh, men just want to keep a girl down when she has a spark of power that shows she's better than them. Yes, that is the red mentality, but that's also the mentality of the people in charge of this show. And if you can't see that, well, then maybe you've got a problem. And I say that to the people who are continuing to say this is the, a great adaptation. All you got to do is look at L'Oreal and tell me, how can you honestly look at L'Oreal and say that is a good representation of one of the most important characters in the entire saga? Tell me with a straight face that, that, that he looks right, he behaves right. Tell me. You can't because you'd be lying to yourself You'd be lying to me. You'd be lying to my audience. You'd be lying to anybody that you'd be saying it's good. All of this has broken drastically from the faith and the spirit of Robert George Wotami. And that's one of the defending arguments that all the stands will use. Oh, it's keeping faith. Even though they've changed it, it's keeping faith. It's keeping to the spirit of Robert Jordan. No, it isn't. When the women are all saving the men and the men are all cucked, it's not. Because they all equally had the share of heroism in Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. Men and women. They all have their moments where one saves the other and vice versa. Women save men all the time in the book, but the men also save the women. And it's in the right, proper moments when it happens. And the women save themselves. The Great Hunt. The end of the book. Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine, when they are in their problems with dissension, they save themselves. They save themselves. But we're not really going to get that. At least I don't see how we're possibly going to get that. Because Elaine hasn't even been introduced yet. She's not going to be introduced till season two in some roundabout way. I don't know how they're going to do that. But that's a whole other story for a whole other video. And we're going to get there because season two is on the way. Bottom line. Once again, we are in really bad fan fiction territory and it's only going to get worse they're only going to pretend to drop fake fan service to try and put some visuals that make you think it's robert jordan's wheel of time but in the end this is amazon's wheel of time this is the kind of trite you could find in the gutter of what was once fanfiction.net I think I'm done here. Thank you for watching this review. If you enjoyed it, a like would be appreciated. If you're new here, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can also follow me on Odyssey. I'm here to give you my straightforward, honest takes to earn your trust and support as I fight to return escapism to entertainment. Hit the notification button, share my video if you like what I'm preaching, and also comment away. Real comments are great. You don't have to agree with everything I've said. But if you're a normal person, we can still have a different opinion and find common ground and get along. We are not stands or SJWs who are cowards behind keyboards. And I don't care what they think. I will never care what they think. And if we don't pay attention to them, between you, me, and the tree, they have no power. So thank you again for watching. 
See you next episode. Howdy, y'all. The first chapter of my fantasy novel, Guardian of Innocence, is now available for free. Click the link in the description below and join me in an old-school good vs. evil story where Cole Larrys, a disillusioned mercenary, suddenly finds himself dropped into the middle of a destiny he never asked for as the protector of Jania Sarai, a blacksmith's daughter who may hold the answers to finally stopping a millennia-old threat to the world of Rosetra. Cole's perceptions of love, family, trust, loyalty, as well as his very beliefs in fate versus free will shall be tested as he struggles to keep Jania safe from the minions of the dreaded Zabor Tal, former champion of the gods and now ruler of the long-forgotten Yis Empire. Click the link below, enjoy the first chapter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and help it grow so that I can bring you the full story in the near future. Thank you, and enjoy the video. Thanks for watching, everyone. I don't do Facebook. I will never do Twitter. If you want to reach out to me, email me at vrennerd at gmail.com. I'm on Getter now, at the Red Nerd, the Geeks and Gamers forums under at Roas, and you can also follow me on Odyssey at the Renaissance Nerd. Thanks again for watching. Take it easy.